the presentation of anarchism, anarchism. a social philosophy which aims at the emancipation, economic, social, political, and spiritual of the human race. The emancipation. Anarchist Essays is brought to you by Loughborough University's Anarchism Research Group. For more information on the ARG, see the link in the show notes or follow us on Twitter at ARGLBORO. More Than Human Precarity by Catherine Oliver. In his 2014 essay, What's the Point If We Can't Have Fun?, David Graeber writes that he watched an inchworm dangle from the top of a stalk of grass, twist about in every possible direction, and then leap to the next stalk and do the same thing. As he watched the worm tracing circles with their body, Graeber wonders if this is how worms play. But this theory that animals play at all is one many ethologists would oppose. What does a refusal to understand other animals and their possibility to engage in play say about the deep anthropocentrism in the orderings and devaluings of space. Across the world, the cracks and violences of capitalism and neoliberalism that have long been obvious to radical thinkers and activists are becoming increasingly fraught and undeniable to increasing numbers of people. As Arundhati Roy wrote, using the pandemic as a portal to another world might allow us to realise much longer political and social change, both by refusing the circumstances of the present and imagining how we might want to live differently. The valuing of other species is related to their closeness to humans, as individuals, in their geographies, both local and global, their historical entanglements, their social and cultural value, and whether their labour has perceived benefits to the anthropocentric world. Take, for example, the bee. Humans have collected honey from wild bees for 10,000 years, and began domesticating and colonising honeybees in around 7,000 BC. In recent discourse, the bee has taken on meanings and representations of crises of climate catastrophe and post-industrial societies where labour and work are highly contentious. The busy, industrious bee's labour brings value not only to humanity, but to the continuation of the diverse, multi-species and ecosystems and worlds around us. This has constructed their imminent loss as one to mourn not for them, but for us for human, ecological, economic and cultural survival. Beavers have be- similarly been revered for their industrious nature, which has led to them being recruited as builders for restoration projects to reduce the costs involved in employing human labour in conservation work. These beavers voluntarily undertake vital work that cares for, designs and reconfigures the natural environment that they live in. These species are made into what geographer Jamie Lorimer calls keystone species, who are able to transform their ecologies for human benefits. Animals are what Marne Barua calls workers in shadows of capitalism. Their labours remain or are rendered invisible, but become pivotal when actual practices of value extraction are taken into consideration. The value of this more than human labour is priceless to not only their local ecologies, but to the delicate balance of the Earth's biosphere. This reduction to species labour, however, not only erases the individuality and agency of other animals, but also determines which animals are valued based on their ability to help preserve the Anthropocene's business as usual. The world beyond the human is not exempt from our social and political systems and their violent consequences, but it can also be a site of contention, resistance and possibility for imagining different futures. In the garden of the house I rent, there is a beautiful eucalyptus tree. In a year when the buildings we live in have become the limits of our work, rest, joy and pain, this tree has sheltered us, watched over us and provided indulgent and healing shade. From the bedroom I work in, I watch two squirrels chase one another. A pigeon tries to perch on a branch they're too heavy for and slips off the end. Tits, starlings and robins visit the bird feeders and two neighbourhood cats visit daily, sitting with me in the garden or watching me plant potatoes. At the foot of the eucalyptus tree grows a quince plant, and towards the end of the garden is a blackberry bush. One Saturday in late February, a friend and I planted a bed of gladioli. Through spring's isolation and loneliness, my sanctuary was found under the eucalyptus tree, watching the gladioli shoot, grow, and eventually die. 
As the months passed, we were guilty of becoming too comfortable in this space that is not our own. In November, the man who owns the house next door knocked on our door and told us he was going to cut down the eucalyptus tree. My heart dropped. After painful weeks of fighting, it was eventually agreed that the tree would only be trimmed back. For anyone who knows anything about landlords and terrible neighbours, you might predict what happens next. This neighbour turns up at our door one day and says, we're coming in now to cut this tree down. Explaining I could not allow access for this and not to cut the tree down, I close the door. 30 minutes later, I look out my window to see three workmen in the garden hacking down the eucalyptus tree. The neighbour had taken down the fence separating our gardens, walked through our garden, opened the gate to our property and allowed in these men to destroy the tree and with it our sanctuary. Now when I look out of my window, I see not only a tree who's been hurt by violent human hands, but also the violation of my home, my space and my inability to protect what I love simply because I cannot afford to own it. I miss the birds, I miss the squirrels and the cats rarely come anymore. The war waged by the rentier class on workers has turned ever more violent during COVID-19 in Britain. As David Madden wrote for City Journal, when the pandemic struck, the state at multiple levels acted swiftly to protect the interests of property owners. Policies regarding housing finance and property tax were swiftly altered to try to maintain real estate values. But rent relief was left up to the discretion of landlords. Workers becoming consistent and uncertain, yet the rent continues to steadily accrue. Precarity, inequality, class, the temporalities of labour, landlordism and the financial crises of capitalism dictate not only how we live, but who we can live with. By fixing bodies in space and time, capitalism regiments subjects. As Silvia Federici writes in Beyond the Periphery of the Skin, the mechanisation of the human body under capitalism is not distinct from the machination of animal bodies and the separation of human life from nature has had alienating and disastrous consequences for more than human coexistence. The hyperlocal space of the home is not divorced from national and global agendas. These forces seep into the private space through allowing ever more violent and salient ways for tenants, not only in deregulation, mismanagement, exploitation and health risks, but also a violent severing of bonds to the locality, the beyond human community and the land through forced precarity. Precarity is a state of mental, physical and social burden and is, as Ivor Southwood wrote in 2019, a vicious cycle. Being kept in such a state of flux and lacking any cohesive group identity means precarious workers cannot focus outwards on social or political concerns. Their attention is instead constantly forced inwards onto their own survival and prospects of escape. Capitalist and state imperatives to individualise the effects of precarity are evident everywhere, notably demonstrated by Southwood in the reframing of mental health as a personal struggle to overcome rather than as deeply entangled with and resulting from structural problems. As Southwood continues, precarity is not an unintended consequence of neoliberal policies of marketization, privatisation and outsourcing. It is rather a central aim of these policies. This structural insecurity, which prevents any attachment to any workplace or occupation and pulls away the safety nets of welfare or housing, exerts its power by invoking and in some cases realising the most primal fears of falling, failing, of being lost or abandoned, of floating in an endless void, of starving, of being left to die. Precarity seeps into our bones. It lives in our bodies. It fills the cracks in the walls of the houses and flats we occupy. It sits next to us on the bus lurks in the corner of our supermarket baskets, asserts itself with every ping of our emails. Precarity produces and demands a perpetual state of anxiety, which David Frame contends manifests as a kind of ambient dread, constantly playing on the nerves. Anxiety becomes an ordinary part of daily life and thinking about the future becomes difficult. For Judith Butler, precarious life is founded on the animality of humans and our shared ways of being in the world as both humans and animals. For academic James Stonescu, Butler's conceptualisation of precarious life means it is because we are beings who can be hurt and killed that we have sociality, that we have a capacity for being together. Although precariousness seems to refer to an individual life, it is rather a way of thinking connections, of claiming kinship and relations. 
If precarity is experienced as and enforces individualising, falling and failing on the one hand, and provides a way of thinking connections of our shared ways of being in the world with other species on the other, how might it be possible to think about productive tensions between the two? In the first lockdown in Britain, human life changed drastically, and this had consequences for the lives of other species. Dog rescue centres and breeders were inundated with requests during 2020, leading to a national puppy shortage. For those who already live with animals, 86% felt they had bonded more, 60% thought their pet helped them maintain a regular routine, and 43% said that their animal had reduced their anxiety. These changes have not been so easy from the animal's perspective. In a Dogs Trust survey of 6,000 people, there was found an 82% increase in reports of dogs whining, a 20% increase in attention seeking, 54% of people reporting dogs hiding, and 41% reporting dogs being clingy. In the three months to January 2021, the same charity received thousands of calls inquiring about rehoming dogs that had been impulse bought during lockdown due to people being too busy or not comprehending the dog's needs, and animal charities are bracing themselves for abandonment of lockdown puppies in the near future. During the same time, the British Hen Welfare Trust, an organisation that rehomes retired commercial egg laying hens, have received unprecedented interest. The increased uptake in rehoming hens is entangled with imagined food scarcity at the site of empty supermarket shelves, as well as fears over contaminated food, where domestic hens are thought to provide a safe and secure supply of eggs. People who have rehomed chickens have talked about the time and space they've found in lockdown to dedicate to chickens, and longer-term chicken keepers have also attested to the joys they find living with chickens as pets. Watching their chickens is both entertaining and sociable, as well as providing what they call eggs with deep yellow-orangey yolks. However, COVID-19 has rendered vast numbers of people in Britain food insecure, with a quadrupling of food insecurity to 16% of the population. The pandemic has reproduced inequitable spread and responses, disproportionately affecting poorer populations, both virally and economically. Both chicken keeping and dog adoptions are largely middle class pursuits, and it's unlikely to be precarious or poorer populations living in insecure, rented and overcrowded housing, whose experience of the pandemic has created space for enriching relationships with animals. More than human cohabitations are not limited to animal others, but also raise questions of access to wider natures. As I record this essay, I look out of my window and see the eucalyptus tree marking the space that is not ours. For those living in precarious, overcrowded and urban spaces, the policing of people's time spent in green space and the demonisation of people using this public space has exposed the deep divisions and separations of great numbers of people from the natural world during the last year. Capitalism has alienated people not only from their labour, from themselves and one another, but also from their place in more than human communities. This is the consequence of a direct attack by the elite on the precarious classes. For many, living with animals is a distant dream, and tending or caring for plants or vegetables and the rich beyond human lives this allows is prohibited. Even where outdoor space is available, the long shadow of precarity perpetuates an undercurrent of insecurity that, at any time, your housing could be taken away. Where beyond human relationships are built, they're easily snatched away. These violent attacks on the spaces we live in are not only evident in exceptional invasions, but in the very bones of precarity that neoliberal society has forced upon and within us. The pushback against landlords has become well-trodden territory online, especially citing the expropriation of tenants' labour for landlords' game, exposing landlordism not as a job, but as exploitation. Particularly relevant here is the role landlords have taken in placing limits on acceptable modes of living, positioning this policing of others' lives as work. At the same time, landlords have pushed down standards of houses whilst charging ever-increasing rents under the guise of market rates. For most, their property ownership is seen as an investment, which should be protected against those who pay to live there. In this relationship, animals are a threat to this property, even as, as explored extensively elsewhere, animals are themselves property. Animals are, as Erica Cudworth explains, subject to economic and legal exploitation, as well as in patriarchal and colonialist systems of oppression that will not be undone only by the freedom to live with animals, 
but by concerted and determined efforts to unlearn and reimagine more than human communities. Domination is deeply entrenched in Western society over other humans, animals and nature. More than human precarity prohibits the possibility of generous and intimate interspecies relationships so that we can't learn about and know other animals and the natural world or develop relationships with them. This forced separation between humans and other animals, between humans and knowledge of the natural world, of other beings and doings, is deliberate. So, what might we take away from or think about within this multi-layered and complex meshwork of nature, animals, humans, infrastructure and society? As Colin Ward contends, the concept of a free society might be an abstraction, but that of a freer society is not. While rural Britain might more obviously be built on interspecies violence of farmed animals, there are, as Richard White writes, extreme levels of violence and misery that concern more than human sentient beings entangled within the urban fabric. Paradoxically, the very fact that this violence is so pervasive and commonplace means that it becomes, for all intents and purposes, hidden in plain sight within the urban environment. The fabric of space depends and is constructed on species domination and distancing, which has become ever more ingrained with the industrialization of farming over the last century. Not only are farmed animals driven away from human settlements into factory farms and slaughterhouses, but this industrialization has devastated biodiversity, bred new diseases, and entrenched animals of all kinds as lively commodities, who live for humans, not with us. The ways we live with other species are not an unintended consequence of capitalism, but are, as Jason Moore contends, part of capitalism's law of cheap nature, where, he writes, capitalism must not only ceaselessly accumulate and revolutionise commodity production, it must ceaselessly search for and find ways to produce cheap natures, as low-cost food, labour power, energy and raw materials. In the Anthropocene, the beyond human world is at once exploited to produce cheap natures and simultaneously a luxury enclosure. Across the world, animal-human nature relationships are highly situated, contextual and varied, but they are all subsumed under capitalism's domination. In the Western world, and specifically in Britain, this colonialist, patriarchal capitalist structure manifests as a disappearing of animals and nature in our everyday lives. They become strangers on the margins of human-centred societies and spaces, subject to contingent inclusion based on their benefits to the human. In January 2021, the Conservative government in the UK are set to pass a law in England that will make intentional trespass a criminal offence, primarily targeting the traveller community. 92% of land in England is private, as are 97% of rivers and canals and this criminalisation of trespass will further entrench our alienation from other species and from our beyond human communities. Animals, humans and nature are not distinct categories, but act and are acted upon by one another in what Jason Moore calls creative, generative and multi-layered relation of species environment making that is premised on humanity in nature, not a separation of humanity and nature. Our fixation in time and space has reiterated the untruth that we are separate from nature. These dispossessions refuse us the opportunity to undo and resist the defining relationships we have with other than humans. Under circumstances of precarity, insecurity and exhaustion, how could it be possible to understand others? How can we resist on behalf of those we are not allowed to know? As Matthew Hall points out in a 2011 essay on eco-anarchism, we need the construction and practice of ecologically anarchic relationships to connect with the physical world of plants, animals, rocks, fungi, beetles and water. The actual realised everyday interactions between humans and non-humans need to be fully infused with the spirit of anarchy. This is not a desire for the domestication of wildness, but rather for a reinstatement of meaningful zones of encounter with other species that should encompass our political and practical visions of the world beyond the human. Thank you for listening. 
To help others find anarchist essays, please rate and review us wherever you find your podcasts. And if you're interested in anarchist ideas, why not check out the journal Anarchist Studies? For over 20 years, Anarchist Studies has been publishing original research on the history, theory, and practice of anarchism. For more information, visit www.lwbooks.co.uk forward slash anarchist studies.